Okay, so this is the start of a new series where we're going to talk about the most popular myths in American politics and in specifically in the American economy. And the topic we want to talk about, the myth we want to talk about in this video is the one about how the housing collapse was caused by the government forcing banks to give mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. Now, when you hear people say things like that, usually what they're referring to is something called the Community Reinvestment Act. And the first thing you need to know is that that was passed in 1977, 30 years or so before the banking, before the subprime mortgage collapse. The other thing you need to know about the Community Reinvestment Act is that it applies only to deposit banks, only to institutions that take in deposits from customers like banks, savings and loans. It does not apply to mortgage companies because mortgage companies don't accept deposits. In the subprime era, 14 of the 15 biggest subprime lenders were mortgage companies, not banks. 14 of the 15 biggest subprime lenders weren't even covered by the Community Reinvestment Act. These three companies, all mortgage companies, were the biggest subprime lenders. These, just these three companies, Countrywide, Ameriquest, Quest, New Century, did over $250 billion dollars in subprime mortgages, and they weren't covered by any law that made from the federal government that made them do it. Now, one other thing you need to realize is that there are 7,357 deposit banks, according to the FDIC. In the bailout, 926 different institutions actually received bailout money, and not all of them were banks. Some of those were private investment firms, some of those were insurance companies, but for now, let's just pretend that all 926 of them were deposit banks. That would mean that there were still 6,431 deposit banks that didn't get, didn't need any bailout money, or about 87% of all banks. So we need to ask ourselves, if the government was forcing banks to make bad loans, how come 9 out of 10 banks didn't need any bailout money? Now, here's something else you need to consider, you need to be aware of. Since Obamacare was passed by Congress in 2010, the Republican-led House has voted 33 times to repeal it. And this at a time when Republicans didn't have the majority, don't have the majority, in the Senate. And so the Republican-led House voting to repeal Obamacare is an exercise in futility. It's meaningless because they know the Senate's not going to do the same thing, and therefore Obamacare is not going to be repealed. Still, they took the time to vote 33 different times to repeal that bill. Yet, for four years, from 2003 to 2007, the Republicans did control both the House and the Senate, and yet they never voted one time to repeal the Community Investment Act. You have to ask yourself, why not? And the very simple reason is they were making money. If we look at the two years, the biggest two years in the subprime era, 2005-2006, and we look at the stock market, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, they all did good. Well, so did the banks. These are the banks that supposedly were being forced by the government to loan money to people they knew couldn't pay it back. And yet you can see the Bank of America did about as good as the NASDAQ and just a little bit less than the Dow Jones. J.P. Morgan actually did better than all of these uh, stock market indices. And for a bank like J.P. Morgan to do better than NASDAQ over a two-year period, that's pretty rare. Banks usually don't do as well as the tech sector. And yet, we look at all these banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, over this two-year period, they were up 13%, 21%, 13.6%, right in the neighborhood of the stock market in general. Well, you have to ask yourself, if they were involved in this subprime mess, because the government was forcing them to, why would anybody ever buy their stocks? If you were investing in the stock market in 2005 and 2006, and you knew that the federal government was requiring banks 
forcing banks to loan money to people who couldn't pay it back. Would you even buy one share in one bank stock when you consider you have thousands of stocks on the NASDAQ, in the New York Stock Exchange, in all kinds of sectors, the oil sector, the retail sector, the tech sector? Why would you even get involved in the banking sector? And yet, while all this was going on, people were more than happy to invest in banks. And again, the bottom line is because the banks were making money. They were taking all of the hundreds of billions of dollars in loans that these were writing. They were grouping them together, slicing and dicing them, turning them into different types of securities that they could then turn around and sell to these people. Pension funds, hedge funds, charitable trusts, retirement funds. Now, it gets complicated how all this worked, but basically you had rating agencies that were in on a scam, basically, rating these mortgages as being better investments than they actually were. And so pension funds and, and trust funds and private investors were willing to invest in them. The banks, the Wall Street banks, were taking the hundreds of billions of dollars that these mortgage companies were writing, whether the people could pay it back or not, and they were securitizing those loans. And that's, that's the bottom line. The Wall Street firms were buying every loan that these mortgage companies could write and turning around and selling it to or allowing these investment funds, hedge funds, pension funds to invest in these mortgages. And that's really the heart of the matter is that these mortgage companies, when they wrote the mortgages, knew they weren't going to be in business with this new homeowner waiting 30 years to receive monthly payments. They knew after 90 days, after receiving three payments, they could group all of their recent mortgages, regardless of quality, package them up, sell them to Wall Street, and then Wall Street would take it from there. And that's at the heart of the matter, is this practice called selling to securitization, which we're going to talk about in the next video, but it is basically where the mortgage companies are writing all the mortgages they can so they can turn them over, sell them to a, a Wall Street bank who will then, quote unquote, securitize them, turn them into investments for hedge funds and pension funds. And so the bottom line is that the mortgage companies had no interest, no long term relationship with the home buyer, so they didn't care how qualified that person was. And that's at the heart of the problem. So if you believe in the myth that it was the government forcing these poor innocent banks to lend money to people who couldn't pay it, then you have to ask yourself, why didn't most banks fail? Why did mortgage companies that weren't subject to these rules from the government, why were the, they the ones most involved in writing some pro, subprime mortgages? Why did stock investors who could invest in any kind of stock under the sun, why were so many of them willing to buy bank stocks? And why didn't the Republicans ever vote, even one time, to repeal the Community Investment Act? They found the time in a year and a half to vote 33 times to repeal Obamacare, but not once in that four-year period from 2003 to 2007 did they vote to repeal the Community Reinvestment Act. And you have to ask yourself why. It's because the banks were making money. And in the next video, we're going to go into detail about the idea of selling to securitization.